Thanks again to the worship team. Just to share with you before I begin to share the message, I've prepared the message today mainly with uh, new folk in mind who are going to be in the second service, hopefully with their children, and we're going to have a family type service here, and it's a shorter message than normal, that's why I said we've got a bit of extra time, and uh, it's a slightly different structure to what I would normally uh, preach, so just so you're aware of that, um, and we're going to focus on this illustration right here before us, hanging above our heads today. He's got the whole world in his hands. That's the theme that's been shared with the children during the holiday club this week. And uh, to me, that theme, he's got the whole world in his hands, speaks very clearly of what we call God's sovereignty. God's sovereignty. And God's sovereignty is a truth that touches all of our lives. If you begin with the word itself, the word sovereign, it's both a noun and a verb. As a verb, to be, to be sovereign means to, to rule. And as a noun, to be sovereign means to be king. To be the absolute ruler. And to, so for us to say today that God is sovereign, He's got the whole world in His hands, means that God is in charge of the entire universe all the time. Very simple definition of God's sovereignty. God is in charge of the entire universe all the time. Now let me say a few things about that truth of God's sovereignty today. I want to say first of all, it's not a popular truth. You don't hear a lot of sermons about this subject in most churches. You know, we like to go to church and we like to hear about Love, and we like to hear about grace, and we like to hear things that are going to make us feel better about ourselves in spite of the fact that we're sinners. We need to hear that God is in charge. Secondly, it is a humbling truth. It's a humbling truth. God's sovereignty reminds us that He's God and we're not. You know, we think we, we're ready to, to advise God as to how He should run the universe. And God just looks at us in very human terms and says, How many stripes have you got on your sleeve? <laughs> What's your rank? Who are you to tell me how to run the universe? It's like a person that come to visit my house. And they start to criticize the things in our home. They don't like the color of the walls. They don't like the pictures. And once they finish criticizing, only one comment is appropriate. Sir, ma'am, whose name is on the title deeds of this house? When you start paying the bills here, you get a vote as to how the home is decorated. Until then, just feel free to say nothing. <laughs> and you know, that's what God's sovereignty does. God's sovereignty puts us in the place where we feel free to say nothing about the way God runs the universe. It's a humbling truth. He's God, we're not. It is also an uplifting truth. You see, when you believe that God is sovereign, that He's in charge of everything all the time, you have a very big God. The problem with a lot of people is their God is too small. The God they believe in is too small. He's just there to help them out occasionally, to give them what they not only need but what they want. Too small a picture of God. But if you understand and you believe and you grasp the truth that God is sovereign over the entire universe, you will never have a small God ever again. We've just been singing, how great, how great 
is our God. It's an uplifting truth. We have a great, big, mighty God. It's a mysterious truth. It brings us face to face with the problem of evil and free will. You know, this is something that people debate ad nauseum. And it's been debated ever since the beginning of time. If God is sovereign, they ask, why is there evil in the world? And if man and woman, men and women have a free will, how then can we say that God is sovereign? And as I say, it's been debated for centuries. I would say very simply this. I would say there's nothing that could ever change the truth that God is sovereign. Nothing we do, nothing we say can ever change the truth that God is sovereign. And at the same time, I would say that you and I are totally responsible for the choices that we make. That's how the two come together. We don't often or always understand how the two work together. God's sovereignty on the one hand and man's free will on the other. But I want to say they do. The Bible says God is at work in all things. In all things. For the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So it addresses the whole issue of God's sovereignty and man's free will. Then I want to say it is a clarifying truth. When you believe in the sovereignty of God, when you believe that God's got the whole world in his hands, there's no such thing as luck or chance or fate or coincidence. You either have God or chance, you can't have both. I love the little story of the cowboy who applied for medical aid. And the medical aid broker asked, was going through the form, and the broker said to him, have you had any accidents during the past year? And the cowboy said, no. He said, but I was bitten by a rattlesnake, and a horse kicked me in the ribs, and that laid me up for a while. The broker said to him, weren't those accidents... The cowboy replied, no, they did it on purpose. <laughs> How about you? Do you believe that some things that happen, maybe some things that happen to you, take God by surprise? God is sovereign, friend. He knows all things. He is in control of all things. I love what somebody said. I don't know if it was a theologian or just an off-the-cuff remark. Somebody said, God is too sovereign to be lucky. And then I want to say, the truth about God's sovereignty is an empowering truth. If you believe that God is sovereign, you will not be intimidated by other people. Yes, you will respect authority. We should all do that. We will respect authority, but we won't cringe before authority. I love what David said. You know, David went down to fight Goliath. Imagine the courage it must have taken for that teenager to go and fight a man the size of Goliath. You know what David said to Goliath? He said to him, I come to you in the name of the God of Israel, the Lord of hosts. David had a big God, didn't he? David had a big God and it made Goliath look like a midget. He wasn't intimidated because he came in the name of the Lord his God. Now let me share a couple of verses with you now about God's sovereignty. First of all, they were on the screen, they're in your notes as well, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 11. Ephesians 1 verse 11, it says there, For he, that is God, for God chose us from the beginning. 
And all things happen just as he decided long ago. And then Psalm 103 verse 19. It says there, The Lord has made the heavens his throne, and from there he rules over everything. Those two verses stress God's complete sovereignty over all the affairs of the universe. Nothing happens outside his control. He rules over all things. Now I know these are vast, broad, breathtaking, sweeping statements that I'm making. And I'm not going, I haven't got the time to go into all the detail today. But I want you to know that God rules over all things. He doesn't rule over everything except for your boss. He doesn't rule over everything except for your husband or your wife or your children. God doesn't rule over everything except for your problems or your sickness or your failures. Friend, the sovereign God rules over all things, including every detail of our lives. Now remember, I said already, we are responsible for the choices that we make. But in spite of those choices that we make, sometimes bad choices, sometimes wrong choices, doesn't alter the fact that God is in charge. Amen? God is sovereign. Let me read to you Isaiah chapter 40, verse 22. Isaiah 40, verse 22, it says there, He, God, sits enthroned above the circle of the earth. And its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground than he blows on them and they wither. And a whirlwind sweeps them away like chaff. Do you get the picture? It's a good reminder of how God sees us. The nations are like a drop in the bucket. We are like grasshoppers. The rulers of this world are like dust in the wind. God blows on them and they disappear. They're here today. They're gone tomorrow. Even the mightiest rulers last only a few years, don't they? They appear, they prance on the stage, they do their thing, and then they're gone. See, it reminds us, God's not impressed by all our claims to greatness. Oh yes, God's made us to enjoy what he has given to us. God's made us to make the best of the potential God that he has given to us. But we can never ever come before God and say, God, look how great I am. I'm so impressed by that. Remember who we are and remember who God is. Now let me wrap it up. With what I call, for want of a better word, just to keep it simple, the practical uses of God's sovereignty. Maybe a better word would be the practical outworkings of God's sovereignty in our lives. Let me share some of them with you. Because God is who He is, because He is sovereign, because He's got the whole world in His hands, I want to say we can have confidence in God's ultimate victory. Amen? We can have confidence in God's ultimate victory. You see, God doesn't live in time like we do. God lives outside of time. And in eternity where God lives, you know what? The battle's already won, isn't it? Amen? The battle's won. But from our perspective, the battle is raging all around us, isn't it? Corruption, load shedding, and all that goes with it and behind it. 
the economy, all the problems that we're dealing with, COVID and all the rest of it. The battle rages all around us. And all too often, what do we see? We see it looks like the bad guys are winning. Not so. But I want to tell you today, friend, God's sovereignty guarantees the ultimate victory. Not only of good over evil, but of God over the devil and all that he stands for. It's just that our timetable and God's timetable are not always the same. We live here in time and space. God lives in eternity. And the battle is won. So we can have confidence, not in our strength, not in our ability to win, but the fact that God has won the victory. As Paul says, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Confidence. Secondly, it gives us comfort. Comfort in the midst of our trials and afflictions. We've all learned that over these past few years. God uses the hard times to teach us about his character. I'm sure every one of you here today, if you're a Christian, you can testify to the fact God has taught you something about himself during these hard times. Amen? God has taught us a number of things about himself. He humbles us. He humbles us through difficulties. So that we come to the place where we say everything that God does is good and is right. Amen. All his ways are just and right. Comfort in the midst of our trials and afflictions. And thirdly, this truth of God's sovereignty, God's got the whole world in his hands, brings us to a place of a deep sense of of security a deep sense of security if you know that God is sovereign you know that you can be content in the midst of less than ideal circumstances there's just a peace there's just a presence of God that you cannot explain amen you cannot explain but you know that God is with you and more than contentment, we can even find joy in the midst of those circumstances. Not in some bizarre way, but in a way where we know that the joy of the Lord is our strength. Weeping comes for the night, yes, it's very real and it's there and it's part of God's gift to us. But joy comes in the morning, amen? Amen. A deep sense of security in less than ideal circumstances. And then the last one I want to say today is this. There are many, more, many other practical outworkings of God's sovereignty. But God's sovereignty shows us the only way to be saved. The only way to be saved. You see, I said already, sovereignty humbles us. It reminds us, He's God, I'm not. And you know what? That prepares us for salvation. It's only humble people who can be saved. The proud people cannot be saved. You know why? Because they won't admit that they need God. They think they've got it all. And they've got it all together. We have to humble ourselves before a sovereign God. And we have to accept his gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. A sight I'll never forget. And it's quite a few years ago now, but it's still fresh in my mind. And if you ever visit Israel, the Holy Land, one of the sites you'll visit is the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem. Some of you may have been there. That church has been built over the reputed spot. Whether it is or not is not really all that important, I don't think. But that church is built over the reputed spot where Mary gave birth to Jesus. And to get to that church, you have to walk across this broad plaza. 
And then you come to a very small entrance. In fact, it's so small, you have to duck down and go through the door like that. And it's been made that way deliberately. Because several centuries ago, the big shots of the town, they liked to ride their horses right into that church. And the priests felt that that was inappropriate. Correctly so. And they made the entrance low and small to force those so-called great men to get off their horses before entering in to the church. And that's a picture of salvation, you know. If you want to go to heaven, you've got to get off your high horse. You've got to humble yourself and receive God's gift of salvation. Amen? I love the hymn. It became popular, so popular, during Billy Graham's ministry right around the world. It was sung almost at every one of the meetings. It was written by a young lady who came to know this truth, that she had to humble herself and come as she was to receive God's salvation through Jesus Christ. I just want to share the words with you once again. Maybe you know the hymn very well. It says this, Just as I am, just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Just as I am, Though tossed about with many a conflict, many a doubt, fightings and fears within without, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. And he has the promise of the gospel right here in this verse. Just as I am, thou wilt receive, will welcome, pardon, cleanse, relief, because thy promise I believe, O Lamb of God. I come, I come. Friends, that's the promise God makes to you and me. If you will come, if I will come, just as we are, and believe those gospel promises, that Jesus died for our sins, and that he rose again from the dead, he will welcome us, he will pardon and forgive us, he will cleanse us, he will relieve us. Of our burdens as we come and experience his salvation. I trust that you will grow in your walk with the Lord Jesus. You've come to God by faith through the Lord Jesus to the great Lamb of God. God in his sovereignty sent Jesus to be our Savior. He's there comes to us, he offers us his free gift of salvation. What a God, what a God we serve. He's got the whole world in his hands. Amen? God bless you. Let's ask the worship team to come and lead us.